pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Okay? All right? You got that? All right? You ready? Here we go. Read your Bible. Pray every day. Pray every day. Pray every day. Read your Bible. Pray every day. And you'll grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, grow, grow. And you'll grow, grow, grow. Read your Bible. Pray every day. And you'll grow, grow, grow. Excellent singing. Wonderful. You guys did spectacularly. Very good. All righty. See you guys and gals later. Excellent. Good morning. So nice to see everyone this morning. Beautiful day. Memorial Day weekend and all that fun stuff. Brand new outline. And we are in a series on ecclesiology. And this morning we are finishing up with the tithes and offerings portion of our lesson. I'm going to direct your attention to the book of Philippians. Let me see here. Yep, Philippians chapter 4 is where actually we're going to get started at. I don't think, yeah, I didn't put that in the, in the notes there, but Philippians chapter 4 is where we're going to get started. We've been talking about tithes and offerings, and uh, several weeks back as we were talking about that, I had a couple people ask me about fundraising and things like that. We've, I've had some good discussions with some folks here at church over the last uh, several weeks um, about different things in reference to that. But uh, So I want to talk a little bit about fundraising. This is, um, um, and I want to start with this verse of scripture because actually it's what I wanted to end the Sunday school lesson with, but I figure we'll, it'll be the bookend. We'll start, bookends, we'll start and finish with Philippians 4.19 that, uh, that says this. In Philippians 4.19 it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord. It is uh, such a blessing to be able to be back here uh, in your house Thank you for your precious word, and do ask, Lord, that, uh, that you teach us some things today. And Father, um, throughout this lesson, I pray that you'd help us to understand the importance of dependence upon you. And Lord, for so many things, certainly in our salvation, but Father, even in the, the carnal things of life, and that is uh, finances and just meeting the uh, financial responsibilities of our ministry. And just want to thank you, Lord, for how faithful you are in so many ways. Now, bless and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're, talking about, we're going to talk about fundraising. And, and so this is not, uh, it's one of those subjects where you get a lot of different opinions from a lot of different people. Um, uh, there are a lot of churches do a lot of different things, not just churches, I mean other you know, um, religious organizations do the same. Uh, if you, um, it's a strange thing. Um, um, you make any kind of contribution to anything and you're going to be on the list and you're going to get solicited from so many different locations. I remember uh, very many years ago, uh, brother, uh, brother Aaron Boyd, of course, was in our ministry for years before he passed away, but he used to send some money to a couple different organizations that uh, he was familiar with. And he was telling me, he would constantly, he showed me one time, because he would, he would keep the envelopes, constantly getting, because your name gets out there, you know, there's a list. And uh, so he would, he would have, you know, he'd get his mail from the mailbox, and there'd be, I don't know, maybe a half a dozen things from different organizations wanting money, uh, religious organizations, missions organizations, uh, charitable organizations building, you know, whatever on some foreign field. And... And he used to collect them, uh, the envelopes sometimes, and so he would have stacks of these solicitations. That it just was just nonstop. Um, and so there's a lot of folks out there that are going to try to separate God's people from God's money in all kinds of different ways. But I want to talk about fundraising particularly. I'm not talking about sending out envelopes across the county here, but I'm talking about, you know, how does, you know, do we raise fund? That's the question I have up here. Should a church or its ministries, 
and I do realize some churches have multiple ministries, um, solicit funds from the general public. And that's kind of the question we have out there this morning that we'll be talking about. Now, I grew up, of course, in a Roman Catholic church, and any guesses, the largest fundraising event in the Roman Catholic church that I grew up in? Anyone, anybody want to guess that one? Eric stuck his hand up. What? What? Bingo day. The bingo? Actually, um, bingo, they did the bingo, but that was not the big, that was not the big one. They, they did have a craft uh, thing every year around Christmas time, but that actually was not the big one. Bizarre? That was really bizarre, but no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sure. No, you're fine. The, the biggest fundraiser was the carnival. So uh, every uh, end of the school year, so end of May, beginning of June, that time frame, they had the big carnival, Holy Rosary Carnival every year. I think there's uh, church in Browns Mills. Uh, what's, the, what's the big church, Catholic church in Browns Mills? St. Anne's. St. Anne's. They do, a, do they do a carnival every year? Okay. And a uh, big fundraiser. Um, of course, uh, the Catholic church I went to had a Catholic school, Holy Rosary School. That's where I went to elementary school. Uh, and so that was part of that fundraising also, which included, of course, the raffle, which was the, they called it the basket of cheer. Okay? They raffled off every, every week um, during the crown of a week, the basket of cheer. Does anybody want to guess what the basket of cheer consisted of? It's booze, eh? It is booze. It was a big old laundry basket filled with all kinds of liquor, um, because right across the street from the church was Yetter's Liquor Store, and the church and Yetter's had a really good relationship. Um, I think they bought all their wine through Yetter's, too. But anyway, Yetter's donated the basket of cheer. They made a lot of money selling raffle tickets for that. And, not to be undersold, um, the other, and uh, of course the carnival went on outside, but in the basement of the school property, the school building where I went to school, went elementary school, they turned the fellowship hall in the basement into a casino. And so there was blackjack tables, there was roulette wheels, and they had a bar open. And so folks were buying alcohol. All, this is, yes, yes. So this, is, this, is, this is Roman Catholicism at its finest, okay? Yeah, I know it. Um, but this is, see, that's, that's what I grew up with, and I never thought a thing about it. That's just what you did. And they raised a considerable amount of money every year uh, on the tickets for the rides, of course, and on the sale of alcohol and gambling, and that's how they, that's, that was fundraising the Roman Catholic way, okay? That's what I was used to. And so, you know, that, uh, we are not going to do that here at New Testament Baptist Church. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things that go on. I mean, to the, to the simple things like you get out. I, I haven't seen this lately, but I remember uh, when we first moved here, there were several charitable organizations that would set up tables outside of the Walmart. And I'm not talking about Girl Scouts selling cookies. I'm talking about churches and, uh, you know, like St. Zion's Christian Church Ladies Auxiliary Missions Fund or something, and they're selling, you know, you know uh, hot mitts and doilies. I, I don't know what they were selling. But uh, you'd see that often. Um, I, I, well, you don't see that much anymore. Um, there, so there's a lot. Of, all right. This is, um, I, I've mentioned this before. I'm talking about how churches raise money. I've mentioned this before. And so I had to actually look it up this past week because I know I've mentioned it, but I, 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 did, yeah, I, I remember it from a news article. This was back in 2015. Um, there was a church here in Burlington County that was kind of got called out on the carpet. Uh, they, this was not illegal, but this is what they were doing. All right. Uh, here in the state of New Jersey, you can purchase, um, you can purchase the liens on, on, on properties. Now, do you, if, what a lien is, okay, let's just say, let's just say, Sam, you were not paying your property taxes on your chicken coop, okay? All right? So the state of New Jersey puts a lien on your property, all right? In other words, you're not paying your taxes, so um, there's, uh, we're going to take, um, take legal action against you, all right? So in the state of New Jersey, someone else can buy that lien, so let's just say Dave over here 
who is an entrepreneur, wants to make some money, buys the lien on your chicken coop from the state of New Jersey, and then sends you a nasty gram saying, if you don't pay what you owe, because he just paid your taxes. He bought your lien. So now he can send you an nasty gram and, and ask you to pay that to him, plus interest, plus penalties. And if you don't, I'm kicking you out. Absolutely nothing illegal about that in the state of New Jersey. Anyone can buy the liens on other people's properties, OK? which people do all the time. But there was a church in Burlington County. Um, it was actually, the, the, the actual purchaser of it was actually the school associated with the church. This was the Fountain of Life, the one that just had that big fire. Fountain of Life, uh, their school, which is um, the, the Life Center Academy, uh, this is back in 2015. Uh, 2014, and it came to light in 2015, uh, news got a hold of it because they were buying up liens on properties and then sending out the notices to collect, and then people that weren't paying, they were evicting. And so, yes, so some that was a lady, I, I think it was a single mom living in, she was actually living in a trailer. They bought up, the, 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 the lien was on the property because the trailer was owned by her outright, but the property was, had a lien on it. And she, wouldn't, she wasn't paying the taxes on the property. And so they confiscated and evicted her. And she said, what? And when she found out it was actually the church that was evicting her. So that made big news. There's absolutely nothing illegal about it. But is it moral? So what they were doing was raising funds for their school through the purchase of, of liens on properties. Well, there's a good, there's a fundraiser right there. Okay, now I, I couldn't let this one go because I'm reading this article. Um, this is about a week or so ago, I'm reading this article and, and then it mentioned some other things. Um, Fount, the, the Fountain of Life, again, um, they had a, um, an antitrust lawsuit brought against them by the state of New Jersey. I don't know what a church has to do. Now, antitrust means uh, bad business practices, unfair business practices. I, I, it's, I, it's a big blanket term. But they had an antitrust lawsuit brought against them by the state. And I was, so I was digging a little bit. I couldn't find out anything about the antitrust suit. Yes. Is this since the fire? No, 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 no. This is back in 2015, 20, oh, the oh, same time frame. Gotcha. Okay? okay. So, um, So I'm reading some more, and then I find out that they had another lawsuit brought against them, same year, um, a civil lawsuit by the former pastor. So, and I, I, okay, it's all, I mean, all the legal stuff is out there, the papers there, the court documents are all public records, so you can, you can spend a lot of time reading this. And I'm just thinking, how does a church raise money? You know, so <laughs> somehow they got themselves in trouble with the, with the government for some kind, of, some kind of bad business practices. I mean, to have, a, have an antitrust lawsuit brought against your ministry, um, that's, that's a pretty big deal. But the civil lawsuit was their, for, their former pastor. And from what, from what I can read about it, it sounded like he's the guy that actually helped get the ministry started. He worked without salary for, you know, a dozen plus years. But with, and this is all in the court documents, but with um, the, the, the understanding of certain, um, certain benefits that he would receive. So he's not getting a salary. He's not having to pay taxes on everything. But he's getting all kinds of benefits, all right? A new car every two years. That was actually listed in there. A new car every two years. And, and, so, and so the ministry, and this is what the document says, the ministry was getting such a place that he felt like he couldn't stay anymore because of the direction the ministry was going. So it, as he put it, he was forced out. And, and then they, they decided not to do anything as far as compensation. And so, all right, I don't know, somebody here mentioned to me a few weeks ago about people scavenging through the rubble looking for gold. I found out why. Yes, it is true. Okay. Gold. There's gold in them there, pile of ashes. So what the pastor did was he had, 
I guess the church had set up some kind of retirement account for him. So he transferred $400,000 from the retirement account, bought gold with it, and had it shipped to the church. And it was intercepted by the church secretary, and he never got his hands on it. So somebody thinks there's $400,000 worth of gold sitting in the ashes over there on that property. I don't know. This was a few years ago. Oh, I don't know. He's, he was filing a lawsuit in order to get the, that was part of the lawsuit. So anyway. Why are we doing the news? I, I just, all right. And I'm reading this stuff and I'm thinking to myself, you know, a church needs to conduct its business a little bit better than that. And, uh, you know, that all centered around, um, you know, this idea of trying to get funds, trying to, um, the, this was back in 2015, but the, the, the value of property and goods, the value of the ministry was $60 million back in 2015. And, and so, you know, I'm looking at that, and I'm just, you know, I'm just asking the questions, you know. It, what, what does a church, what, what should a church do in order to conduct its business, raise funds, and maintain uh, the integrity of the ministry? And, and certainly, whatever they were doing was not what, what he ought to do. And, um, and so that, those kind of things, and I, I just, you know, I just spent, I don't know, an hour or so just researching online and find out that information. Uh, I imagine we could dig up a lot more, but that's the church building, of course, that burnt down just a few months ago uh, there in Florence, and uh, their sanctuary just burnt to the ground. Um, you know, horrible business dealings. Um, very poor choices as far as how to finance and maintain uh, the financial integrity of the ministry. Just some, just some really, really shady things going on. And, and so, you know, that kind of stuff, um, when you read about it, you just think to yourself, I mean, it's just, you know, is, is that what needs to take place in order for a church to be able to pay its bills? And so, you know, I, I just asked the question, you know, is there anything in the Bible that talks about fundraising, that talks about, you know, how a church should um, maintain its, you know, financial stability and things like that? And, um, you know, some churches nowadays, of course, um, have, like you go to their website and there's a big button down the bottom that says, donate now. Um, and so churches do that. Um, that is not a blatant uh, solicitation of funds, but uh, you know anybody could anybody could just you know hit the button and, and give some money to that church, and and you know there are a lot of ministries that do that, and so uh, and so again it comes to that question: Should a church solicit funds from the general public and um, and come up with schemes, so to say, in order to generate funds, and so. I was just thinking about this over the last couple of weeks. I have a couple of statements down there. There are times that unsaved people did give money. And, and Nehemiah is a classic one. That portion of scripture in the book of Nehemiah chapter 2. You remember Nehemiah. He is a Jew. He's in captivity, of course, with the Babylonian captivity. The, Medo, uh, the, the Babylonians have taken him out. The, Nido per, the Medo Persians are now in charge. Uh, and Nehemiah is uh, on staff uh, at the palace and... Um, has a good connection with, uh, uh, with the uh, leader of the, of, the, um, of the empire. And, you know, here he is, and he's been praying because he heard about Jerusalem and things, how bad things are. Uh, the walls are broken down. Of course, the folks have already started going back. And he, um, you know, um, uh, the king says, hey, what's, you're, you, what's going on with you? You don't look very happy. And he said, well, how can I be happy when, when my people are living in a place like they're living, the walls are all torn down, the gates are burned with fire. And, you know, the king says to Nehemiah, what can I do? And I just wanted to read this, and this from Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 7 and 8. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it please the king, let letters be given to the governors beyond the river that they may convey me over till I come to Ju uh, Judah. And so he's just asking for safe passage and the letter uh, unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's garden, that he may give me timber to make beams and gates and, uh, for the palace and, uh, which apprehended to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand 
of my, of my God upon me. And so, you know, here we have the, this is, you know, basically government-funded reconstruction of the city of Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah is asking for it, um, asking for the letters. And uh, he, you're gonna, as you read through the book of Nehemiah, you find out that there's even going to be more added to it. Matter of fact, tax money that's taken up over there is actually going to be used uh, for the Jews to rebuild. And so there's a lot of government financing that happens here. Um, I was just reading this a couple weeks ago, and that is, of course, the end of the book of Exodus. And many of you, if you're doing your Bible reading through, you read this passage several weeks back also. But uh, Moses and the Israelites, when they left Egypt, uh, they, they spoiled the Egyptians, right? Um, the, all the things that they gathered from the Egyptians are going to go into the construction of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Um, so I'm reading from Exodus 12, 34, and the people took their dough before it was leavened, uh, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians." And so here we see, again, this tremendous amount of income coming into the nation of Israel. Um, and, and yet, um, uh, I mean, they use words like borrowed and lent. Um, that's kind of interesting phrases there. It's kind of like when you borrow things from a family member and you never give it back. You know, like tools and things like that. Not that it happens in our family at all. But um, the, um, this borrowing that goes on here. Um, but the, the things that came in from the Egyptians are going to be used for the building of the, uh, of the tabernacle. Um, this one came to my mind recently in our, um, this Luke chapter 7, uh, the generous, the centurion that's mentioned from Capernaum. Um, now when they had ended, uh, this is uh, Luke, Luke 7, 1, and now when they had ended all, um, now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him um, uh, the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying, For he was worthy for whom he should do this, for he loved our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue, and so here's uh, uh, you know a centurion, a Roman soldier, builds a synagogue um, for the Jewish people, and so that is uh, certainly not something um, you know that would be common. Uh, but if you know, basic, if you would, an unsaved person, uh, it's kind of it would be kind of like us having a you know a building project, and some somebody you know some philanthropist comes and say you know I'll build your church building for you. And we would, we would stand around and look at each other and go, what do you think, guys? Should we let them do that or not? Huh. Okay. So this is, these are some of the instances here. Now, which, what I find interesting about this is that there is somewhat, uh, you know, a, with the centurion, no, I, mean, I don't see any solicitation there at all. Uh, you see the other two, uh, Nehemiah basically asking for, you know, safe passage and for, uh, some, some wood, uh, but he gets much more than that. So there is some solicitation there in that sense. Uh, certainly with the plan with the, with the Egyptians, they, they, they did like Moses had uh, commanded them, go and, go and borrow things, and they went and did that. And, of course, the Egyptians just gave them more uh, than they probably ever anticipated, and it was just an amazing thing. And so, you know, there was some solicitation in that sense, uh, but it was not a general solicitation like anybody that wants to give can give. Um, it was some, a very specific need, and they did ask, and, and God supplied it. And what's, what's interesting, both with, um, uh, with Nehemiah and with Moses, there was, it's a very specific event and very specific direction from God to do these things. And so um, I just want to point those out because these are the kind of discussions that often take place in reference to fundraising, you know, um, because there, there are events in the Bible 
where we see unsaved uh, being asked to give, and they give. And it helps, the, it helps that uh, ministry, uh, in particular, the building of the temple, a tabernacle in the wilderness, and, of course, the reconstruction of the temple uh, during the, t- uh, the city walls, and eventually the temple itself, of course, constructed in Jerusalem. And so, you know, these are the kind of things that often lead to a lot of discussion ab- about, uh, about fundraising. And so um, to say there was never any solicitation I, I, I have to hesitate, and I say, well, they, they did. They did ask. Um, now, um, that's Old Testament, I know, most of what we looked at, particularly with, um, with what's going on here. But, um, you know, what about the New Testament? You know, uh, what about money uh, from outside of the ministry? And, and so, again, we're talking about us. So, um, the... Um, you know, the couple instances we see in the New Testament, particularly in reference to money, uh, the first one, of course, is benevolence among believers. And that's that great passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 11, uh, where we, uh, we've been, we, a matter of fact, we talked about that a few weeks ago, about this offering that was taken up uh, for the poor saints in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 11, uh, verse number 27. And in those days came prophets from Jerusalem and Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And so this is, uh, of course, that, that, sh- that um, offering shows up in many of the epistles um, where Paul is talking about that, we've, we've talked about that um, quite a bit a few weeks ago, talking about tithes and then offerings. And so, but we see primarily what's going on here is benevolence, but it's among believers. And so uh, when Paul is asking for folks to donate, he is asking for the churches. And that, that's what the churches did. The church in Philippi had a particular passion towards it. And he mentions that. We see the church in Corinth Um, being dealt with in reference to how they should do it and don't wait to the last minute and give them a lot of particular instructions. But these are, these are churches. And so, uh, you know, is it, um, do churches, um, do churches or should churches cooperate uh, financially? And and certainly that is the case. Uh, Many churches do. When our ministry first got started, of course, um, there was financial needs, and we had churches that gave um, on a regular basis to our ministry. We're going to talk about missions here in just a second. Uh, but one of, the, one of the big things, of course, was the purchase. We didn't actually purchase this property. Uh, we had to pay off the indebtedness of this property is what we had to do. But we needed to come up with, uh, I think it was around $40,000. Um, because when we, uh, when we found this property and the church that was here by uh, um, Victory Baptist Church, they were just down to a handful of folks. They could not pay their bills anymore. They had, they had been in arrears uh, for, in several areas. And so um, the agreement was is that they would give us the property if we would pay off their indebtedness. So we said, okie doke, let's do that. So um, they said, well, if, if you can do it in 30 days, we'd be really happy. <laughs> so, you know, it, um, we, uh, we immediately, you know, started sending letters out to churches. Um, Doug Hammond, of course, the Lehigh Valley Baptist Church, um, he put it out there because uh, he, he knows a lot of preachers, has for many years. And so, you know, for the next 30 days, uh, we had checks coming in constantly. We had a P.O. box in the borough, and a lot of them were mailed there. Um, but we had checks coming in. It was, I, I just love getting up in the morning and going to the post office. As I go in there, open it up, and there'd be an envelope, and there's a check. You know, there's $1,000, there's $3,000, and, and just it, it went on. That went on for an entire month. So churches from, um, from all across the country um, Plaque Road Baptist Church, we support Brother Noah George. I, I didn't know anything about Plaque Road Baptist Church. They sent us a check for $3,000. And I asked Brother Hammond, I said, who is this guy? And he said, he's telling me about the pastor. And, 
And uh, actually, Plaque Road Baptist Church was actually started by Gary Hampton, missionary that we still support there in Alaska. It was started by Gary Hampton back in the 70s, uh, late 70s. And um, just it's a small ministry, um, but uh, just faithful, serving God faithfully there in Fairbanks, Alaska. Actually, North Pole is their mailing address. But... Um, Small congregation, they, they took up an offering, sent us a check for 3000 uh, bucks. There was a uh, brother, brother Brandon Berg. We met him a, a year ago. Um, he was pastoring a church out in California like forever. But uh, that church in California had, uh, was, um, he was, uh, Brother Brandon Berg, if I'm remembering the story correctly, he, be, he was reading the, the, the website Lehigh Valley has uh, concerning their missions and saw our, our portion of that website for the mission work here in New Jersey and had that statement on there that, they're, you know, that we're trying to get some funds together uh, in order to, um, in order to, get, to get this property. And, and the church out there in California immediately sent a check out here. And it was, it was $1,000 plus dollars for that. And uh, this, was, this went on. Um, this went on for, for you know, those 30 days. Um, we passed around the plate amongst ourselves, and we came up with a little over three thousand, just amongst ourselves. Um, you know, the, the families in here in the church back then. This is back in '96, but um, it was uh, we came up with with every penny of it in thirty days, and it was uh, it was not a general solicitation. Uh, these were all from churches uh, all across the country that just said we want to help. Um, so, um, do churches cooperate in giving? Oh, most certainly. Most certainly. Um, you know, a couple years ago, um, Brother Steve Castile, which is, you know, our daughter-in-law, Rachel's dad, he pastors out there in, in uh, Washington State, and they were kind of, you know, somewhat of the same situation that we were. They were mission work and uh, meeting in Grain a Grange Hall, uh, for many years, and they had a building available, and they needed to raise some funds in order to um, purchase a building, and uh, we did the same thing. We sent them a check. So, you know, churches do that. Is there anything wrong with that? Uh, I think the, the pattern we see in the scriptures is that churches do help out other churches uh, in, in a lot of different ways, and part of that's, of course, fi with finances. Um, let, me, let me say this, that... Um, when a church does try to raise funds, there are people that hear about it and they, they send money. And um, so there are some, uh, the majority of the funds that came in when we purchased, you know, that had this uh, financial need for this property, um, most of them came directly from churches. But there were some individuals that, that sent checks. Um, we never asked, uh, we never made a general, you know, plea, you know, please send us money kind of thing. It was all done through the churches that we, that we knew about, but there were folks that heard about it and sent money. So I'm not going to tear up a check and say, oh, you're not a church, so we're not taking your money. Uh, but that was, not our, that was not our intent. Our intent was always to work through the Lord's churches. So anytime that there's any kind of um, a need financially, there are folks that are going to personally that are going to send send money. Um, you know, I, I I know I've talked about this in the past, but I um, I feel the same way not only on the receiving end that we solicit we don't solicit from general, but I always encourage people not to send uh, money personally to different ministries. Uh, churches, I believe, ought to be involved in um, in helping ministries. And not necessarily individuals, and I'm I'm very careful about that. That's something we could talk about uh, again in the future. But uh, kind of works both ways. Um, the second uh, portion there about uh, about money for missions, and that uh, that's Philippians chapter four. And we we read um, we started with uh, a particular verse, but uh, but Philippians four fifteen. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, he sent once again, once and again unto my necessity. And so we've talked about that before and talked, you know, when we talked about missions, giving, uh, offerings and such. But, but again, this is, this is money for missions. This is one of the areas that a lot of churches cooperate in. 
uh, and that is, um, you know, when, they're raising, when missionaries are raising support to go to the field, we, we cooperate with many churches and have cooperated with many churches over the years as, in reference to missions, and so, and we'll continue to do that. And I do know this also um, for missionaries that I know. There are some missionaries I know that some of their funds actually came, come from private individuals, okay? They will, uh, and, and again, they're not, they're not soliciting um, generally for people to support them, uh, they're actually going to churches and asking churches to support. But there are individuals that, that, have a, that, that feel a need to send uh, personally to missionaries, and that does happen. And again, I don't, uh, there's not very many missionaries that I know of that would you know, say, hey, no, keep your money, send it to your church. But, uh, but that's not, uh, the, you know, the goal is not uh, to do that, generally soliciting funds. It's usually directed through the ministry. And so, you know, uh, money for missions is... Uh, um, the majority of the money that goes to missions goes through one of the Lord's churches. And it's from a church to a church, and that church's ministry. And, and so, uh, you know, again, it's not a general solicitation. Um, it is uh, very specific for the mission work and through that church. And so that, uh, that's a, a lot of the money that goes from church to church generally is for, is for missions. And there are some churches out there. Matter of fact, I was talking to a pastor. This is probably two or three years ago. I'm trying to remember what state that is. I think he was in Indiana somewhere. And um, he, uh, uh, they had a missionary at a church that they were funding um, almost full. Um, in other words, he was on staff there. They were paying a salary, and they were going to be sending him off um, to do some mission work. Um, I, I don't, uh, he wasn't church planning in the U.S. I think they were sending him overseas. But, um, but all, of, uh, all of his finances were coming through his local church. In other words, they, he didn't go on deputation. He wasn't raising support. There wasn't you know, a dozen churches or 20 or 50 churches supporting him at all. He was on, he was on staff, and they were, the church was supporting him 100%. Now, that's, that doesn't happen a lot, but it can, and it does. And, um, and so there's that lack of cooperation, and there's, you know, some goods and bads about that. But, um, but for, for the most part, most churches um, have some type of, of cooperation financially. But again, um, noting, it is, it is among churches and it's among believers. Uh, it is seldom or ever a general solicitation just saying, hey, anybody wants to give? I'm going, I'm going to be a missionary. Um, you, you get a T-shirt that says has one of those uh, donation sites on it. I'm a missionary. Send to this money. Send money to this. T- uh, text text your money too. Um, that, that's. Have you ever seen that? I, I it was not for a missionary, but it was. It was I was. We were. I, Joyce and I were driving somewhere, and we were next to this car, and they had just apparently just gotten married. And they said, we just got married, text money too. And then they had one of those sites down there where you can send money, you know, like Zelmi kind of thing. And I'm thinking, what a, what a deal. I mean, we live in such a great society now that most people think they can solicit funds for just about everything, all right? So anyway, if you're trying to raise money for something, uh, write it on the back windshield of your car and see if you can get some money out of it. All right, so... Um, uh, down there at the bottom there, attitudes towards uh, concerning, uh, concerning money. Um, the, uh, I, I put this down here because I was talking to another preacher uh, a short while ago and I was, because uh, we were talking about fundraising and, I, and I, said, I said, this one is really stretching the context, but I said it's a great verse of scripture. But uh, that, that's that one in Psalm 37 uh, and it starts off verse number 23. You're very, very familiar with this. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he may not, uh, he, uh, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hands. That's a great verse of scripture. And, and then the psalmist goes on, verse number 25. I have seen, um, uh, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging. Bread and, and that verse came to my mind immediately when I was thinking about fundraising. Now, fundraising is not necessarily begging, and the context here has nothing to do with fundraising. It has to do with God 
taking care of his people. So the, I'm, hermeneutically, I'm really stretching this one, okay? Uh, and I admittedly so. Um, but the, the premise, of course, is the idea that God's people do fall sometimes. They do go through some hard times. There are some struggles. Uh, but the Lord steps in, and he, may, he, takes, care of, he takes care of things. And, um, but he, he mentions, the psalmist mentions particularly that um, there doesn't need to be any begging involved because the, the dependence is supposed to be upon God. You know, and I think about that, and, you know, again, that's, you know, this, that verse of Scripture has nothing to do with fundraising. I know that. But it does have to do with dependence. And, you know, our ministry has, has, has had some ups and downs financially. We've had some times where, uh, you know, we've had a couple of the men of the church sitting around talking about what bills we're going to pay, uh, you know, this month. And uh, there were a few times where, um, you know, um, we had to, you know, be very creative about how we paid things because things got tight. So there, there's been a few of them. Um, but the Lord has always provided. Um, we never got to the point where, you know, we, um, we got ourselves in any kind of financial trouble. Uh, we didn't have to start buying up liens on properties in order to make money, okay? Um, we didn't have to be uh, overly creative. It's just, you know, what bill are we going to pay this month, you know? Um, but we rode through those storms. Um, we put some things in place to see that they didn't happen again, and uh, the Lord's blessed. Um, this uh, verse of Scripture, to me, is a reminder of how faithful God is, even though that we do have some difficulties, because it does say, though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down. And that's the, the idea is there are times where we, we stumble, um, and that, that applies to a lot of different things. We're talking about our church and finances, and there are times that there's some stumbling that goes on, uh, but the Lord is there. Um, Genesis chapter 14, I, I put this verse in here because there was a preacher I was talking to recently, and this is uh, the verse that came to his mind in reference to um, um, not taking money from anywhere else. Uh, Genesis 14, 21, it says, uh, this is, uh, this is um, uh, Abram. Um, he, uh, his nephew Lot, of course, was taken uh, when the kings... Um, defeated uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot was taken into captivity. And, and of course, a Abraham gets his servants together, goes off, rescues him, defeats those kings, gets all the spoils of war and all those things. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, of course, he's returning everything to the, to the king there. He said, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. This is what the king of Sodom says to Abram. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord. So in other words, Abram says, listen, I, I asked God for this victory, and I asked God to take care of things. So I've, I've, this is between me and God. Um, the Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, that's you know, the extent of God's resources, you know, that I will not take from, uh, from a thread even to a shoe latch, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich. And so, you know, Abram's attitude is that, you know, God is the one who takes care of my needs. I don't need anything from you, especially if taking, soliciting from you is going to give you an attitude like you're something special and spiritual and so, you know, this, is, this has to, a lot more to do with attitude than it has to do with the dollars and cents. And, and, of course, you know, as that goes on, Abraham says, you know, the folks that were with me, they had some stuff, you know, whatever those, those guys had is fine with me. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, we're, we're good. I don't, I don't need anything from you. Uh, Abraham was more concerned about the attitude than he was necessarily about the, about the money. Now, this is, this is one of those areas where um, um, I guess there's a lot of concern because there are times, and I've told you, there are times we get phone calls and folks say, I want to donate some money to your church. Um, it happens. And so um, I, I shared with you a couple weeks ago, this, this happened um, 
you know, a couple years back while we were get, just getting started uh, on uh, refurbishing the, um, that poor, that, this side of the basement. We had just about ready to dig out that, uh, have that uh, trench dug out for the French drain. Um, and a guy calls me up, said, I'd like to donate money to church. Um, and I said, well, I'm at the church right now. And, you know, he came on over. He said, oh, what are you guys up to? I said, oh, we're doing this. Right now. And, they, and I said, well, yeah, we're having a contractor come in this week. He's going to be putting in the French drain. And he said, well, what's that going to cost you? I said, oh, it's about $3,000. And he writes me a check for $3,000 and said, here you go. So, you know, paid for it, which is, I'm very thankful for that. But, you know, this is, that verse of scripture is what kind of begs the question. Because um, now you have somebody, and I don't, I don't know his heart, you know. He was telling me he used to go to church at a couple different churches here in the area. Things happened. Doesn't feel comfortable going to those churches anymore. If I mentioned the names of the churches, you would recognize them. And um, so I asked him about his salvation. He's, you know, says he's a believer, uh, but just not in church. Invited him to come out New Testament. Oh, thanks for the invitation. You may see us in some time in the future. Who knows? Okay. Um, but, you know, I don't know what attitude he has. Does he think he's, you know, being right with God simply because he writes us out a check for 3000 bucks? Who are we to question that? Exactly. No. Yeah, and he did, and it took care of a need. Yeah, and I, and I, I don't, oh, I don't have person. a problem with it. Yeah, that's cool. But you know, if there was somebody that blatantly was telling me that I'm giving you money so that I can go to heaven, I would venture to say I probably would not take the check because <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to instill in somebody a confidence of something that God is not promising. So I'd be careful with that. Yes, sir? It is. It's a completely what it is. And that is, that's, they're buying their way to heaven. Okay? And it is a works-based salvation. Um, I don't know if you've had the instance yet, but I know, I've, you know, in the years, I've done a lot of door knocking, and I've had people ask me, can I give you a check for a donation for your church? And I always tell people, if you'd like to do that, you just come in on Sunday and drop it in the offering plate. I've had folks offer me cash out on door, doing door-to-door -door visitation. Okay, I'm, I'm like, ah, don't, don't give me the money. Um, and so that happens, brother. People want to make donations while you're at their door. And so, um, yeah, and you don't know what's going on in folks' minds. Some people think they're buying their way to heaven. Um, you know, when we, were, uh, when we were on our first phase of the reconstruction downstairs and we're ordering the doors uh, and we got a gigantic discount on our doors the first time around and the guy made some kind of, the salesman made kind of, some kind of statement about, uh, you, just, you know, uh, it, uh, hundreds of dollars off the original price. It was, it was one of those, you know, remember me to the guy upstairs kind of thing, you know. It's like, all right, you're going to get yourself into heaven because you gave me a discount on a door? I don't know about that one. Give me chapter and verse. But, um, I mean, it, this happens a lot, Brother Sean. It reminds me of um, Simon the Sorcerer. Yeah. He, 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 he wanted to buy the yeah. gift of the Spirit. Right. Yeah. Pastor, I don't think that way. So I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. We're still speaking. She has, has, she has to turn her thing up a little bit. Um, no, just, what, just one second, Deborah. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, Peter says your money perish with you, and he wouldn't take it. Yeah, exactly right, and and that's exactly the attitude that we do have to be careful of, because there are a lot of folks that think that that finances is used as spiritual leverage, and that is a dangerous thing for a church to to uh, begin to play with, even and not even outside the church, even inside the church. And there was a pastor I know, he was going through some very difficult times with his congregation. There was some, um, they, as a matter of fact, they were going, they were going to have to do a, a vote of, kind of a vote of no confidence type of thing because there's so much dissension in the church. And he told me in particular, there was one particular man who came to him and says, well, listen, you know how much we donate every year to this church. And I'm just letting you know, we're not going to put any money in the offering plate until this issue is settled. Let your money perish with you. <laughs> it's exactly because people do think that finances is leverage, not only with a church, but also with God. You can't leverage God. 
And, and so fundraising takes that kind of a strange twist, especially when it is a, uh, when it's, especially when it's a generic, open, general to the public um, fundraising, because there are some folks that have it in their mind that by giving, I'm going to get something from God. And God will not be a debtor to any man. So there really has to be this caution involved. Yes, ma'am. I'm just naive, I guess. Aren't we all? I just, I don't think that way. Yeah. So I have a hard time. But there are, there are a lot of people that do think and that way. I feel like, wow, I'm really naive that I'm, I think that these people are doing so yeah. good when then you put in my mind that, no, they're trying yeah. to. We Deborah, sometimes, sometimes being naive helps you sleep at nights. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, there are, there are a lot of, there's a lot of strange things that go through people's minds, especially when it comes to their relationship with God. And as a church, we don't want to do anything that is going to promote that type of thinking or action. And, and part of that. Now, I, I, I want to finish this. To, please notice at the bottom there, there is no chapter and verse. Okay? There is no chapter and verse in the Bible that says, do not solicit funds from the general public. You're not going to find it. There are a lot of churches that do it. There's a lot of churches that have the donate now button at the bottom of their website. They'll take money from anybody at any time for anything. Okay. And I know that. And so, you know, there's no, you go to this verse of scripture, but you know, that, that verse that we started with uh, this morning, but my God shall supply all your need according to the riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You know, there may not be a chapter and verse that says, do not, do not do this. But, the, you know, but why should we? You know, why should we solicit, generally solicit funds from the public when, when we have the opportunity of trusting God? Now, certainly God is going to lay burdens on people's hearts uh, to give. There are certain times where folks are going to give unsolicited, like has happened to us on many occasions. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm not going to turn it away, as, you know, if there's no indication that they think they're buying their way to heaven. Um, but that is, that's not what we do as a ministry. That's never what we've done as a ministry. And Lord willing, that's something that we're never going to do as a ministry. And that is generally uh, try to solicit funds in order to promote our, our, the growth of our ministry. I've said this, I don't know how many times, but if God's people in God's church are faithful with the simplicity of tithes and offerings, we will never be at a place where we even have to consider trying to get funds from somewhere else in order to keep our ministry going. Uh, because God blesses that faithfulness. And as long as God's people are faithful, then God blesses. Well, thank you very much for being in Sunday school this morning. Lord bless you.